original railroad stations that was built along the rail line here. The railroad construction started on it in 1902 and they finished it about 1920. It was constructed to haul timber, logs off of the mountain. They were cutting timber on the mountain and they had sawmills at the base of the mountain and they brought the logs from, from uh, the uh, top of the mountain down to the sawmills and cut it into lumber. Uh, in 1902, there were very few people living here on the mountain. But as the railroad developed, people came. And they originally used the railroad strictly for hauling logs. But as people came, they changed the railroad's personality a little bit and began to haul what they called mixed trains. And a mixed train would have a, uh, an engine, a coal car, uh, two or three log cars, a couple of passenger cars, a uh, mail car. The station was the post office for this little community that cropped up here. Uh, they'd have a mail car, a couple of freight cars, and a caboose. So that was a pretty good sized train to pull up the mountain. And that's how the train and the rail line got its name, the Virginia Creeper. It could only run 10, 15 miles an hour, and that was so slow, people just called it the Virginia Creeper. Uh, well, as people began to come, there was a need then to change the nature of the station. And this room in the station became the general store for the community. Everything that you see here in this room is original. Uh, the benches, the display cases, the shelves on the wall, and a lot of the merchandise on those shelves are from the 1920 to 1940, 45 time period. Um, the room behind this one, the second room back here, became the passenger waiting room and ticket office. And then behind that room is the freight room where they would bring a freight car up, pull it off onto the little siding right beside the building here, and unload it and store the freight there until, uh, until the uh, owner came and picked it up. So uh, if you'd like, we'll walk back to the uh, passenger waiting room, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. The hallway that we walked through over here was the ticket clerk's area. And she sold tickets to ride the train through this little window right here. Customers came in from this outside door into the waiting room, walked up, bought their ticket. If the train were going to come shortly, they just took a seat on these benches and waited. If they were going to come the next day, they'd go back home and come back and wait. And they could ride the train anywhere that the train went to Abington, to West Jefferson, uh, in the entire line. Everything in this room is also original. The stove, the benches, those benches have been there since 1914 to 1920. Uh, and this became the passenger's waiting area. It was also the station master's office. His office uh, desk was right over in that corner. Um, and he was the Western Union Telegraph operator uh, for this area. And I didn't notice until a couple of months ago, but on this wall right here, there's a little mailbox, and it has uh, all of the codes for the towns that this operator could reach. Uh, for example, right here is the code for West Jefferson, and it is one long, two shorts, and one long. So if the operator here had a message to send to West Jefferson, he would hit his keys, dot, 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 dot. One long, two shorts, and one long. And that would alert the operator in West Jefferson that he's about to receive a message. And he would get his pad and paper ready to go, and he would uh, type or write down that message and get ready to translate it. and. Uh, uh, deliver it to whoever it was for. This is the freight room. Uh, they hauled one or two freight cars on the train. They had a siding right outside the building here where they could pull a freight car off, 
and leave it sitting to be unloaded and the main train on the main track could go right by it and continue to run. Uh, a lot of the items that are in the room here now are just just uh, articles from that time frame, again 1914 to 1920, and some later items too. This is uh, a piece of equipment that they used back at that time. Every year in the fall of the year when it cooled off, they had a special day out in the country and in the mountains, and uh, many rural towns and farms still do this today. In October and November they had hog killing day and they killed hogs and uh, one of the things they made was sausage and this is a sausage press uh, they used the intestines from the hog at that time for the casing for the sausage and you take the intestines and put it over this outlet right here and then you put your chopped and ground and seasoned meat in here you used a crank to crank the press down and force the sausage into the casing. And you tied the casing off in links with little strings and you made link sausage. And then you put it in your smokehouse and you smoked it for some period of time. And that's the way they made sausage in 1914 to 1920. There are some other interesting articles here too. This is a cone-shaped bucket. You know, back in 1920, if your barn caught fire, you didn't dial 911. You went out in the yard, you rang a big bell, and all your neighbors came running, and they formed a line, shoulder to shoulder, with one end of the line at the well or at the pond, and the other end up by the barn that was on fire. And you used a water bucket, filled it up, and passed it down the line, and threw it on the fire. And you had several buckets and you kept that going and that was called a bucket brigade. Well, they found that if you used just a regular water bucket, by the time it made it from the well to the fire, most of the water had sloshed out of it. So you started with five gallons and you got to the fire and you had a half a gallon left. Someone, and I don't know who, determined that if you used a cone-shaped bucket, the water wouldn't slosh out it would swirl around in the bucket as if it were trying to screw itself to the bottom of the bucket. And you'd use that, you start with five gallons, pass it up the line, and when you got to the fire you still had five gallons to throw on the bar.